Great. So I'm joined by Marcus Clover here today. It's great to see you again, man. I'm really looking forward to this one. Could we just start with a quick kind of two minute rundown on who you are and what your story is? Sure. Hey, James. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, so Mark Clover. I'm one of the founding partners here at Energy Revolution Ventures. Um, we're an early stage deep tech climate fund that invests in breakthrough electrochemical technologies across hydrogen, energy storage, and carbon capture. I actually have a background as a chemical engineer. I've built hydrogen technologies at venture-backed startups um, for the first part of my career across both the aerospace sector um, at a small, cool startup based out of Cambridge, um, and then in the automotive sector. Um, so I've built all sorts of hydrogen technologies um, for all sorts of vehicles. I've designed systems worth millions of pounds. Um, it was then I really um, saw the wave of innovation coming in the hydrogen sector and also got passionate about how important um, hydrogen and then later in my career, electrochemistry generally was going to be super critical for enabling a sustainable energy system. So, um, you know, we put together ERV and I've been now um, a VC um, investing in early stage climate startups for over two years now. Um, made investments globally. We've done seven investments now. Um, and looking forward to telling you a little bit more about that. Yeah, awesome. We'll definitely dig into that. And I think it's a really interesting story because it's quite an unconventional path in terms of working in industry, going straight to kind of being a first-time fund manager, essentially, instead of doing maybe the more tried and trusted analyst associate promotion path. Uh, can you maybe talk about why in particular you thought it was the moment, okay, I need to start a fund here, as opposed to, you know, either working for a VC or even starting your own company? Sure. I think that, um, you know, the thing that gets me most excited about sort of uh, venture and particularly deep tech is some of our largest challenges um, cannot be solved, particularly for climate. We can only go so far with energy efficiency and software solutions. And also rolling out existing technologies only gets you so far. It's really sort of breakthrough, breakthroughs in deep science, deep physics, engineering solutions, which are the ones which are going to really disrupt industry and drive us forward. You know, like... The lithium-ion battery, as a great example, was fundamentally a breakthrough in um, physics and advanced materials innovation, which has now led to a whole wave of innovation. Not just the fact that we've got lithium-ion batteries on our computer and in your pocket, but now it's being used for decarbonizing the whole transport space. So it's these sort of deep technologies which really have those sort of outsized impact um, beyond just sort of software. Um, you know, if we look at the International Energy Agency, they predict that 50% of emissions reductions will come from technologies yet to be commercialized. And that just sort of was what gets me excited about the scale of the impact new technologies have. <laughs> and I guess it's almost like a bit of an edge as well, because I think everything you've described probably scares away a lot of VCs right? In the sense that it's not very familiar. It's perhaps slightly more black box technology, a bit tricky to understand. So can you maybe elaborate then? I know you kind of touched on, you started in hydrogen and now gone into electrochemistry. Can you talk about the kind of pillars of your investment thesis at ERV? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just before I do, um, I just want to just um, talk a little bit about um, this sort of view that deep tech is risky. Um, VC was originally designed, it was originally called Adventure Capital, okay? And it was actually originally designed for very risky hardware businesses from the semiconductor industry, businesses that had almost, you know, very, very low probabilities of success, and required huge amounts of upfront capital to get them off the ground. So actually, go, we're actually going back now, creating deep tech funds to actually the roots of why the whole VC industry was designed. So. Just for a little bit of historical context, that was originally why it was about. Now, at ERV and our we talk about our investment thesis. So we invest in electrochemistry. Why? The world's going electric. Renewable electricity is now the cheapest form of energy on the planet. 
cheaper, che- cheaper than coal. In some of the sunny places in the world, it's now one third cheaper than coal. So what this means is we're shifting from a world where oil and gas is becoming the carrier of energy to green electrons becoming the carrier of energy. But rolling out solar and wind just solves the generation problem. You still need to take those green electrons, store, distribute, and use them to decarbonize every part of society. The interesting thing is we know what the solution to that is. The solution is electrochemistry. And what we mean by that is hydrogen, energy storage, and carbon capture. These are the technologies which allow us to take green electrons and decarbonize every part of society. So you're talking batteries for electric vehicles, grid-scale energy storage to deal with intermittency in our renewable supply, or even make green hydrogen, which can be used as a feedstock to decarbonize a lot of industry, like you know, fertilizer, or actually be used as a feedstock to make things like chemicals and products like plastics, which go in our clothes. That's really central to our thesis. It's really the fact that the world's going electric, and electric, and if you want to use those electrons, you need electrochemistry at the heart of it. Yeah, it's really interesting, and thank you for that that point at the start. I think that's really pertinent. I think I don't know if you'd agree, but it's kind of the last ten or so years. It's just led to an environment where there's a lot of kind of copycat investing, and you know, I've been to a number of software. Um, kind of conventions in the last year and you just start to see the same kind of b2b SaaS apps emerge and i think it's a bit of an indictment of what the investment landscape has looked like for maybe the past kind of three to five years um i think now it's very interesting to see a bunch of smaller shops such as yourself and particularly solo gps across europe kind of start to invest more in deep tech and look um look into the harder problems to solve so i'm really i'm really glad that you guys are on the kind of forefront of that revolution and then in terms of kind of your investment thesis i understand you also have Persemino, your kind of venture incubator if you like where you're starting to build some of the startups of the future that are solving the problems you just touched on uh can you elaborate in terms of kind of how you guys help build these startups, you know, what value you bring and what kind of sectors are you looking at in particular? Sure. Yeah. So, um, uh, Prisemino is really the brainchild of three of the leading professors from UCL, um, some of the world leading academics in electrochemistry. Um, but also they've got this entrepreneurial spirit about them. And Prisemino is really founded on a vision to try to take technology from the lab and get it to market faster. So that's the sort of the why for Persemino. What Persemino does, it's a venture builder. So it partners with um, technologists and founders, invests at pre-seed, so we put capital in, but we then um, really help them build um, startups and technology and get that technology from the lab to market faster. So the key, the key sort of benefits we sort of sort of value add we give is we can give them access to lab space. Um, There is a glut of lab space in the UK at the moment. Um, You're looking at sort of 12 months and a million pounds set up time. So we we, we provide ready to go lab space. We also provide um, access to a sort of deep technical network. So consultants, um, PhDs, and to really help with the hiring process. You need a lot of diverse skill sets to build a deep tech startup. And then thirdly, because Prosemino is backed by ERV and the fund, we have deep connections into the um, energy, battery, and mining space. And so what we do is we really help with the go-to-market strategy. So we really provide um, support in terms of introductions to some of the largest um, energy companies and OEMs um, who can be customers and end users of this technology. Um, and we not only provide the introductions, but we also support them in those commercial negotiations, um, particularly when you have first time founders who are negotiating some very complex contracts first time. The founders really value our advice we provide there. And then finally, we also um, work with the customers to also provide piloting opportunities. So as well as potentially being customers, we also look for partners um, that can pilot these deep tech technologies in operational environments which is typically the sort of the milestone you need to hit for when you want to go raise a series A or a series B. Investors really look for your technology actually demonstrated on a customer site in some kind of operational environment. So those are the sort of the three ways I think we add the most value. And then we do all the standard stuff that most 
incubators and venture builders do. We provide a lot of back office support. So accounting, marketing, um, all the stuff you need to do to run a startup. We also help them with that. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I've, I've spoken to kind of a number of people who run accelerators and incubators, particularly in the UK and Europe. And they all kind of say the same things that, you know, there's this argument that a lot of these accelerators are run either by kind of ex-finance types who don't understand the technology, or they're run by kind of more science-headed guys who don't really understand how to commercialize it. Would you say that's your biggest USP in kind of, from what you described, bringing together an ecosystem of different minds that are kind of able to help these companies throughout the value chain? to help them kind of maximize their chances of success? Let's look at an example I think is probably best to illustrate it. Um, the first company in the program is a company called Ort Energy, um, founded by a guy called Nick Van Dyke, who's from industry. Um, he's got sort of over a decade commercializing um, electrolyzers in industry. So he's been around the block a bit. Um, he decided to partner with us and we invested him um, back when it was a, a benchtop prototype uh, and an idea. And we instantly um, gave him access to lab space and he got a prototype up and running um, in less than 12 months, um, you know, 20 kilowatt system, which is almost unheard of for a speed of electrolyzer. But beyond that, we introduced um, Nick and his team, to some of the largest energy companies in the world. Um, you know, some very, very big corporates, many of which you'll know, they're on track to secure um, sort of multi megawatt orders this year, less than two years after founding. And they've just raised a seed round and one of the largest, um, uh, a very large multinational corporate, an industrial corporate here in, the U here in Europe has invested in their seed round. Now for a very large corporate to invest in the seed round of a technology business, which is less than two years old, is almost unheard of. And that was very much um, credit to Nick and his technology. I think what they're doing is brilliant. But also that would never have happened if we hadn't have provided those intros and also supported through a lot of those negotiations. No, that's fantastic. I can really, really see the value out there. Um, and you just kind of touched on the technology being around electrolyzers. Can you maybe expand more, maybe basically first kind of a one-on-one on what electrolyzers are and what their use cases are, and then kind of expand into where we are on the hydrogen adoption curve? Because I understand your kind of where you see hydrogen at the moment is that we need to keep deploying. Uh, so maybe to elaborate on how the role that electrolyzers play there and what are the kind of barriers to this becoming much more kind of commercialized and scaled up? Yeah, so um, electrolyzers um, uh, split water using electricity into hydrogen oxygen. So you put water in one end and electricity and out the other end you get hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Um, so it's a, and it's colloquially called green hydrogen, provided that the electricity you supply to your electrolyzer is renewable electricity, say from solar or wind. Now, historically, we've made hydrogen from fossil fuels. Um, and until today, it's been uneconomical to make it by any other, any other source, primarily because renewable electricity costs have been too high. So even if you got the electrolyzer for free and it was 100% efficient, because solar and wind is too expensive, it would always have been cheaper to make it from fossil fuels. Until today, where we've re reached this inflection point, where there's now a path forward, where because solar and wind is decreasing in cost by so much, if you can make your electrolyzer cheap enough, efficient enough, and last long enough, you can actually produce hydrogen from renewable sources with cost parity to fossil fuel sources with a little bit of innovation. And that's exactly the problem which um, Ort Energy is addressing. They're driving down the cost of making green hydrogen to the point at which it will be cheaper than fossil hydrogen. Now, this inflection point is really interesting. We're not there yet. Green hydrogen is still between three and five um, dollars a kilogram. Whereas fossil fuel hydrogen bounces between one and two dollars a kilogram. So we're not there yet, but there is a viable path forward um, to be able to reach that inflection point um, probably this decade, I expect. Um, at which point, you know, natural market forces is going to take it off. So in order to kickstart the industry, why would anyone build green hydrogen projects now 
when the green hydrogen you produce is more expensive than um, fossil fuel hydrogen? What incentivizes a customer to take your clean hydrogen over your fossil hydrogen? And, and a lot of it is going to be around regulation. So um, the IRA, for example, um, over in, in, in the States, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, um, I've got a mechanism in there where they've got sort of $3 a kilogram um, so tax credit for hydrogen. And what this does is it's going to kickstart the industry. It'll incentivize those first green hydrogen projects to kick off. The industry starts scaling up. And as we know, as you start scaling up technology, costs tend to come down. After which point, even when you remove the subsidies, people will still opt for the green option because it's economical. So that's how that, that's the sort of state of where we're at at the moment. So that's a really interesting insight. Obviously, I think one that I've heard many times before in terms of customers are not going to buy into a green premium. They're not going to just accept your technology because of the claims of, you know, sustainability and, you know, you're doing good for the environment. Um, and I think that's a really interesting nuance that you pointed out, which is that regulation should be the initial driver of getting that cost down such at a point that we reach cost parity, um, from which point hopefully the industry will take off. Uh, can you then maybe kind of elaborate a little bit more on, you know, something that I've been looking into and heard from many VCs, which is that, you know, the hydrogen infrastructure is going to take, you know, years and decades to build out and kind of where do we even start when it comes to that? Can you give your take on the steps required to actually kind of implement a hydrogen infrastructure? Um, so, so don't get me wrong, I am uh, bullish on hydrogen, but I also agree that the infrastructure is going to take longer than people expect to build out. Um, you know, we'll, we'll come to what aspects of a hydrogen infrastructure you, you need. Um, and the value chain isn't there yet today. So you've got three sort of aspects to your value chain. You've got your production side, you've got your distribution and storage, and then you've got your, your offtake and end use applications. Now, um, um, I think some of the most exciting areas of sort of the clean hydrogen market are those use cases where there's um, existing demand for hydrogen. So uh, a couple of examples. So today, uh, hydrogen is a $110 billion industry, mostly used by the sort of chemical industry to make things like fertilizer and, and also in refineries. A really high, low hanging fruit is to, to, to blend hydrogen into the existing uh, fertilizer production process through Harbor Bosch. It requires, it can be blended into gray hydrogen. So, or you can just switch the, the feed stream of hydrogen from gray to, to green hydrogen with relatively low um, alterations to the customer's um, uh, infrastructure. And another sort of uh, great use case I see is a lot of the um, aviation industry is looking to decarbonize and switch to sustainable aviation fuels. You actually need hydrogen as a feedstock. So SAFs is really interesting because you've got an existing uh, use case, so commercial air travel, you've got customers, which are the airlines looking to use low carbon fuels. And so you've got an existing offtake opportunity for hydrogen feeding into an existing use case with relatively low alterations to the infrastructure. Um, so I think that these sort of initial use cases are going to be the ones that really kickstart the hydrogen economy. And we don't need a fully formed uh, hydrogen infrastructure global infrastructure yet to still to still have sort of large scale impact in the short term. Yeah, because it's interesting because I spoke to a founder the other day who kind of said that we should just focus on getting green hydrogen cost parity with fossil fuels and then we can think about the use cases. Kind of sounds like you don't you don't echo that sentiment and that we should actually target the in maybe a much more conventional way of rolling out new technologies. We should target the existing use cases um, and see where hydrogen can actually add and provide benefits. Uh, I think it's really interesting then because off the top of my head, I, I would think, yeah, heavy industry would be one that would immediately be susceptible to hydrogen. You think about kind of planes that you called out, be very hard to kind of get batteries um, in planes in the state they are now, you know, with the added weight and all of this, it becomes a bit of a cash 22 when it comes to range, um, shipping as well. And then you're kind of, you know, if you kind of throw in steel production in there as well, you're maybe looking at decarbonizing perhaps about 15% of global CO2 emissions. Uh, how, how do you see it in terms of other industries that hydrogen can potentially attack as that kind of beachhead market before, before spreading? Um, so, so in terms of beachhead markets, I think uh, green ammonia is um, probably one of the best ones. 
Um, I think um, there's some good offtake for sustainable aviation fuels. So those are the two I mentioned. Um, there's some interesting initial use cases around um, things like uh, fuel cell um, conditioning. So when a fuel cell gets to the end of line, you actually need to run them for a set number of hours to condition them and prove that they pass quality assurance. Um, it actually needs a lot of hydrogen. So, and a lot of, um, you know, green hydrogen, ideally, um, if you're going to be selling fuel cells for a clean, clean application. Um, so I think there's some really interesting initial use cases there that I think will kickstart the industry and allow, once you reach that tipping point, hydrogen then can then be used for things like marine industry, used for decarbonizing steel, which will require much more build out infrastructure, which we were talking about earlier. Um, but you really need to hit the the, 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 the the tipping point before those industries are really going to shift and invest sort of millions, if not billions, on the infrastructure side to implement that new, um, you know, the, the, the new, new processes. No, absolutely. Um, that's really fascinating. And I know you kind of alluded to it a bit earlier in terms of hydrogen storage. And obviously kind of storage comes in many different forms. You know, you've got kind of hydro hydro storage, gravitational storage even, you know, obviously mm -hmm. lithium ion batteries, you're starting to see flow batteries as well. Are you bullish on hydrogen storage in, in particular? Um, a kind of maybe an argument I've heard against it is that, you know, if you're using hydrogen in the case of storing green energy from solar or wind, then there are kind of a number of losses uh, associated with actually taking electricity, converting it to hydrogen, and then back to electricity again. Um, tell me if you agree with that. And then if not, kind of what are the better use cases for hydrogen as a storage device? So um, hydrogen for storage has, has some challenges. So, so for, for energy storage and then use. Um, so, so, so the, 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 the use case we're talking here just to, 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 to orientate everyone is you have en energy in, you store that energy in hydrogen, and then you create electrical energy out. Okay, so when you go from the energy in to the hydrogen, you have a loss. You store that hydrogen, you then when you convert that hydrogen back to energy, you have another loss. So it's typically got quite a low round trip efficiency. And so this limits its um, economic viability in a lot of energy storage applications. However, one of the, the best use cases for hydrogen storage is actually in your seasonal and ultra long duration energy storage. So today, um, you know, most of our seasonal um, energy storage, so energy storage that we store for sort of months, as well as our strategic energy storage, so sort of most countries store about 47 days worth of their energy supply in sort of strategic assets, either as, you know, coal or, or oil, basically as a backup for your country, okay? There, are li there is literally terawatts of available oil and gas just lying around waiting to be used should a country run into some geopolitical issues or, or some other problems with their energy supply. And when you talk about trying to sort of store gigawatt hours, close to even terawatt hours of energy for months and months and months, most of the other solutions just don't cut it. You know, lithium ion batteries just will not be able to scale from a cost perspective because it has a pretty linear, linear profile. Um, other methods of well, as well have challenges in terms of scaling. And actually, I saw, saw a, um, an article the other day which suggested that hydrogen you could store for sort of multi-months at this sort of, sort of gigawatt hour scale for sort of less than one-tenth the cost of lithium-ion batteries. So that was, the, that was the conservative estimate. The optimistic estimate was 5% the cost of lithium-ion batteries. So you're talking about sort of those are the applications where I think energy storage really makes sense. And then you sort of say, okay, well, where are you going to store this? And I think storing in salt caverns um, offers some really, really cheap um, natural geological formations for storing hydrogen um, for these sort of type, type of applications. So that's the only energy storage application that we've, um, we've, we've reached a, a little bit of conviction around, at least. Yeah, and I've also heard the argument kind of from maybe bigger industrial companies saying that we can, in fact, store hydrogen in existing natural gas infrastructure. So pipelines, uh, for example, in the UK, uh, with, I don't want to say minimal alterations to the existing pipes, uh, but they're currently doing kind of a lot of uh, 
research into the area to try and assess, you know, how much uh, changing of the existing pipe infrastructure would need to take place. Is that something that you see as viable as well as we kind of transition away from natural gas? Uh, blending is definitely going to happen. Um, I mean, it's already happening now. The question is how much blending will happen um, and how useful it will it actually be in terms of um, sort of CO2 reduction. I mean, you know, there, there, there is some sort of challenges with blending into existing pipelines. Um, sealing is a big problem. Um, hydrogen is a very small molecule and fugitive hydrogen emissions have been also demonstrated to have some impact on um, global warming. So it does have a kind of global warming effect. Um, upgrade of existing natural gas infrastructure isn't that easy. We're seeing a lot bigger trend towards um, uh, dedicated hydrogen pipelines. So where most of your offtake is quite large and typically in industry. So some earlier on in the conversation, we were talking about one of the first primary use cases. Um, so mostly industrial, so either for sustainable aviation fuel or for Harbour Bosch. In those cases where you have a very large single point use dedicated offtaker, it actually makes much better sense to build dedicated pipelines. Um, and it's actually cheaper to do that um, than, than, than having to repurpose existing infrastructure, which comes with a lot of complexity, comes up with uncertainty. And I think there will be more and more questions around, you know, how much hydrogen are you actually wasting? Um, not from a, just a cost perspective, but also the, the environmental impact. Yeah. And then if we, if we switch the question then in terms of, okay, you're talking about the offtake, in terms of production as well, do you see that as being fairly centralized? or more akin to renewable kind of solar, for example, a bit more decentralized in terms of, you know, these electrolyzers being rolled out? Um, we're seeing a multitude of approaches at the moment. Um, centralized production definitely has a lot of advantages. Um, beyond just the production side um, of, of, of hydrogen, uh, and, and yes, electrolyzers are uh, modular by nature, um, but typically only makes sense at scale, which sort of lends itself to sort of more centralized production. It, it's more all of the supporting systems you need um, to make an electrolyzer function. So with, with, with a solar panel, you have you know, a panel, um, you have like an inverter, and then you have an electrical connection. With an electrolyzer, you've got, um, you've got the actual electrolyzer, which makes the hydrogen. You've then got a water management system. You've got an air management system. You've got a hydrogen management system. These are all fluid systems, require pumps and, and et cetera. And then beyond that, you need a, a water purification system. Uh, sorry, a uh, hydrogen purification system to clean up and um, dehumidify the hydrogen. And then also you need to compress or liquefy the hydrogen as well. And typically both the compression, the compression or the liquefaction steps do not scale down well. So most offtake applications, you either need you either need pressurized, so then you feed it through a pipeline, or you liquefy it and then you put it and you can ship it through liquid, or you convert it to something else like a, like ammonia or methanol. All of those cases, all of the equipment you need to do that does not scale down well from an efficiency and capex perspective. So it lends itself much better to a very large centralized production facility for those. So those are a lot of the sort of reasons why. Um, we're tending to see uh, a trend toward more centralized hydrogen production um, rather than distributed. No, that is a fantastic insight. Thanks for that. And I think a lot of people listening will be like, okay, you're talking a lot about storage and yeah, we understand the renewables intermittent and we need a place to store them when the sun isn't shining, et cetera. And this is where a lot of people jump in and say, okay, nuclear, nuclear is the answer, right? And obviously there's, it's, it's a very hotly debated topic, particularly online. You just kind of see both sides of the argument where do you stand on the nuclear debate in terms of, okay, I think it's well established that, you know, big plants take a long time to ramp up. They often go well over budget. Uh, do you see, for example, small modular reactors as a potential solution uh, to a kind of providing a base load power for when renewables aren't effective? So personally, I'm a big fan of nuclear. Um, you know, they provide an enormous base load to um, the electrical grid. And it shouldn't be underestimated. We, we really take for granted today the um, resiliency and reliability element of our grid. 
a lot of that today is purely due to the fact that we have nuclear as a fantastic base load. You know, stop, ask, ask people who live in South Africa how important reliability is in terms of rolling blackouts and how important it is to not disrupting your life. Um, and and they, they can probably value how, how important that is. And nuclear provides that great source of it. It's also extremely safe. Um, and we know how to make it safer and people are working on making it safer. So I'm a big fan of of these various nuclear solutions. Whether they'll be able to come down in cost and deliver these mega projects um, any faster remains to be seen. Um, They don't seem to have the same learning rate dynamics that we've seen in sort of the solar or the battery industry. Um, But I do think there's a place for them. And what I've been super encouraged about as well is the, um, uh, the pace in the fusion space as well. So there are some really interesting innovations coming out of there. You know, the question is when they will they crack it? Who knows? Um, but I just, I'd be really surprised if they don't crack it relatively soon considering how much capital and energy is going into that space. Um, also, I might add, nuclear um, doesn't uh, invalidate our investment thesis. Ultimately, these are all on the energy generation. They will produce cheap, cheap electricity. Ele- electrochemistry then uses that cheap electricity. So I'm all for it. I'm a bit biased though. <laughs> yeah. Is it is that that's an interesting point then? Obviously it kind of lies on your value chain. Is that something you would look at in investing? Or do you stay strictly within the electrochemistry space? Um you know, we're still quite a small firm. So um we're we, we try to stay very focused. Um on we need to stay very disciplined on what we're good at and what we're not good at. Um and so fusion would probably be outside our area of deep expertise. So probably not for us. Not for now, at least. We'll wait till the the phone oh, yeah. rises a bit in the coming years. I'm sure it will. I want to ask maybe a bit of a more challenging question, which is something that I kind of discussed on my last podcast with the guys who run the Accelerator Lab at Oxford, which is how, okay, you mentioned kind of rolling blackouts in South Africa. What, do you see a kind of roadmap for providing these kind of technologies to, you know, the countries that need the most developing nations and all of this, because I think there's one side of the argument that says we should just focus on, you know, investment and deployment where there's a lot of funding and we can get these technologies up the curve quicker. And then there's also the converse of that argument, which is that kind of then we'll start to centralize these technologies and, you know, they won't get to these kind of areas that are still very much reliant on fossil fuels. Um, and proponents of the, the counter argument would probably say, okay, we need to invest in technology that is localized and, you know, local entrepreneurs that can help to scale these technologies up. Um, I was wondering if this is something you kind of give thought to or, you know, what your thesis around that is. Um, I don't think I have a general view. Um, other than to say that, like, um, we're, we're involved with quite a, quite a few companies um, based in South Africa and um various mining companies. Um, and we actually see a lot of opportunity for commercialization of a lot of our technologies in um, sort of places you're talking about. So um, we actually see great export potential um, for uh, speeding up decarbonization of some of these. It's mostly industrial companies, so we haven't done much residential work there, but de- decarbonizing a lot of industrial operations in Mining, mining across Africa. I mean, one of the largest consumers of diesel in um, Africa, in South Africa, is mining trucks. So, you know, we, we've actually looked at one of our companies um, creating a hydrogen powered mining truck, which is an excellent application for it, which would naturally help decarbonize that particular segment. Um, so, so I think that. What we what we've tended to look at as well is like where's the the, the technology know how and the innovation, and then where in the world's the application or the or the use case, and then can we get that technology from where it's been produced and developed to where where it's actually needed? No, it's a really interesting framework. Um, and then kind of if we look at startups in this space, then how should you know someone who has maybe a bit of expertise, a PhD or background in these technologies? Where should they look to kind of apply their skills? Because, you know, we talked about a number of technologies over the past half hour or so. You know, where do you even begin to look at the value chain? Is it a case of kind of 
looking within yourself and you know the people that you have access to and the network you have and thinking this is probably the best place I can apply those skills is it the case of doing maybe a bit more of a top-down analysis life cycle assessment and being okay these are the kind of areas of the hydrogen value chain for example that need uh, the most innovation uh, in in a in a sentence then kind of what areas when it comes to the energy transition should people focus on right now so um it's a big question. <laughs> um, I, I can tell you some of the themes that we're looking at intensely at the moment. Um, and then I'll come back and answer, answer your question for particularly for founders or technologists. Uh, so carbon capture is a super promising area, looking at some really interesting technologies. Um, it's currently too expensive. It's you know, way too expensive to capture, both point, point capture, but also direct air capture. There's some really cool uh, MOF technologies around. So metal organic frameworks that acts as absorbent. There are also some really great electrochemical processes, which effectively use electricity as the, the energy to you know, um, concentrate and then, then store the hydrogen, uh, so store the carbon. Ammonia is a massive one as well. Um, it's currently 2% of the global energy, um, you know, half the hy world's hydrogen consumption. It's useful as a, it can be used in energy source and carriers. So any technologies along the ammonia value chain, whether that's on the, the synthesis of ammonia or whether it's in actually using ammonia in energy applications. So, you know, burning it in an engine or using it in a fuel cell. I think ammonia fuel cells has huge potential. Um, and then the final one, which is probably a bit of a, a pet project of mine, is um, people talk a lot about fuel cells, um, which are basically take hydrogen and make electricity to drive electric powertrains. I think there's a real opportunity in high temperature fuel cells. Um, if, if, if anyone knows anyone developing in high temperature fuel cells, I'm super interested in that area. Can, um, you, can you maybe touch on kind of what they are and what the applications would be? Sure. Um, so at the moment, um, the fuel cells you've seen in vehicles, automotive vehicles, are low temperature fuel cells. They operate between sort of 60 and 80 degrees. Um, so, but automotive isn't a very good application for, for hydrogen fuel cells. It's too expensive versus EVs. EVs have pretty much won the race there. Um, but fuel cells can also be very useful for decarbonizing aviation. They have good applications in things like air taxis and drones. Um, the biggest challenge with them, though, is because they operate at low temperature, you have quite heavy radiator systems. And so, add, so while the actual fuel cell is quite light, all the systems around it to keep it at the right temperature to get the air in and out are quite heavy. If you boost the temperature of the fuel cell up to sort of 120 to 160, you can half the weight of a fuel cell powertrain. It, and then you basically unlock hydrogen for aviation. You unlock hydrogen for um, EV tolls. Our current systems aren't suitable. The biggest challenge is no one has made a, a PEM fuel cell system that lasts long enough at those temperatures in that temperature range. And the challenge is solid oxide fuel cells, which operate super high temperatures, so 600 to 800 degrees, they're too heavy and they're dangerous and they're difficult to manage. So there's that sweet spot in the middle. If someone can crack that, you're onto a winner, I, I think. It, it reminds me of something I saw at an event last week, which was uh, the, the company Space Forge, which I'm sure you know um, how they were kind of setting materials up into space in the example of a semiconductor. And the microgravity of space allowed, you know, meant that the structure did not crystallize as much and it was more, more of a consistent material. Uh, there was a dem kind of a demonstration then of a, of a semiconductor being used within an airplane and the huge radiator on the back just to cool this thing, which was basically about this big. And of course, the chip's about this big, right? So it's like you're kind of 100, you're, you're shrinking it by 100 times just by having the technology such that it doesn't overheat. Um, is that... Do you see in the in the case of the fuel cell, is that something that would be intrinsic to the material or would it be kind of clever implementation of heat pumps or, you know, could this be attacked from a number of different angles? So it all comes down to the membrane. If you can create a high temperature proton exchange membrane, which operates between 120 and 160 degrees Celsius, which is stable and has high conductivity, um, the applications are enormous. Um, so it's one area I've been looking at closely, but I haven't found anyone that's cracked that problem yet. 
I think if you crack that problem, you're onto a hundred, five hundred million dollar company. Wow. So do you see this as like a big tipping point towards hydrogen planes? It would be, yeah, it would be it would be transformative if you could do that. Um, I also know that there's various large Japanese OEMs who we have good connections with who I know would be would definitely use this tech. <laughs> That's a great call to action. Is it is it something that is um you know you've kind of found by yourself are there research papers in the space starting to explore this technology? Are there any startups looking at this to your knowledge? Uh, there is one actually. Um, uh, uh, Zero Avia actually bought a company called High Point, and High Point have some technology which is specifically solving this problem. I personally think that was a fantastic acquisition um, from Zero Avia. It solves one of their key technology challenges. So um, yeah, I think that was brilliant. That's the only one I've seen that's um, um, close to commercialization. Oh, was it kind of like a, a bed scale or pilot scale? What was the TRL of the technology out of interest? Uh, it, you know, um, companies moved on a little bit, but when I was talking to them a few years ago, they were sort of at the um, you know, reasonable bench scale um, um, and, and, and had plans to do piloting. No, awesome. But Marcus, um, it's actually been a fantastic pod. Uh, I think it's been really detailed, very valuable insights. Maybe to close then, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there kind of, you know, starting maybe starting companies for the wrong reasons or, you know, wanting to be an entrepreneur for the sake of it kind of thing. Uh, the more people I speak to now, it's okay, I have a problem that I'm passionate about, you know, whether it be climate, energy transition, um, and I want to change the world in that way, essentially. Is there a piece of advice you would give to first time deep tech founders who are looking to make a big impact in the world? Sure. Make sure you're building something that people want. Okay. Too many engineers and academics. Um, myself included for a time period, focus on optimizing something and can spend you know years, if not decades of their life, optimizing something that no one actually needs or wants. Um, it would be much better to you know validate that what you're building isn't needed and then go join someone else's startup and help them build something which has got a proven use case and you know the customers want, rather than spending loads and loads of time you know with tunnel vision on on, on your thing. So really search for, if you've got a piece of technology or you, you've done a PhD in an area, when you first start trying to decide whether you're going to launch something, put huge amounts of energy proving that someone wants to actually use this technology and it's got a commercial use case. Otherwise, you could waste a lot of time and you don't want to do that because then you're not going to have impact with your technology, you're not going to have impact with your life. Yeah, do not have a solution looking for a problem. I think that's fantastic advice. And then to finish up, then do you want to do any kind of call to actions? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, we're, I mean, if, if anyone's an entrepreneur or founder building technology in the, the hydrogen, energy storage, or carbon capture space, we'd love to hear what you're up to and talk about it. Um, we have sort of deep in house technical expertise, hydrogen engineers, battery engineers. Um, but then through Persemino, we also have a big network of experts. Um, um, second, finally, we're out fundraising. So we've launched our first fund. Um, we, it's already got, it's a non-blind pool. So it's already got uh, seven investments in there, um, which are pregnant, some of which are showing upticks in value. Um, so if there are any investors who want, are interested in exposure to the hydrogen energy storage and carbon capture market, um, come talk to us. We've already backed IP out of Cambridge, Harvard, UCL, um, National University of Singapore, um, and we've co-invested alongside some of the largest um, energy companies in the world. So we'd be more than delighted to, to talk to you um, as well. Well, fantastic. Thanks so much for your time. I uh, really hope we can do this again sometime in the future. And yeah, best of luck with, uh, with your first fund. James, it's been, thank it's been brilliant. Thank you so much. Cheers, Marcus. Take care.